Right, welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. I'm Rafael Yoseni. I'm Ade Soa, Omoruan, and I'm Sheito Atigari. Good morning. Well, the common objective of macroeconomic policy all over the world is to maintain a high and sustained output growth in conjunction with low inflation. But in Nigeria, the story seems to be different as Nigeria's annual inflation edged up to 11.24% in September this year, making food prices to increase the most in three months. Very correct. Going back to February levels, uh, although some economies have attributed the increase partly to the recent border closures, as some caused uh, the shortages, as some said the smuggled commodities such as rice at the moment are really, you know, fueling this increase. At the moment, Nigerian economy is still growing slower than the population rate of its population. I mean, and it's obvious that, you know, this is also increasing the poverty rate in this country. Uh, what this is presenting is a very dire situation for the country, you know, in such a way that creating jobs becomes very difficult and, and the unemployed population keeps on budgeting. Mm. Yeah, the, fra the fragile recovery in the economy means that additional policies which would fast-track economic activities in the country are urgently required. Joining us now on the discussion, Nigerian Economy and Inflation Group, is Bayo Rotimi, an investment banker and chief executive officer of Quest Advisory Services. Welcome to the show. Pleasure Thank you. you sir. Pleasure All right. to be but, here. But, but let's, let's start it up uh, this way. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we know the federal government set up a committee to look at uh, the way the increase in minimum wage will influence inflation numbers. The impact. The impact. Mm -hmm. We have not started paying minimum wage fully. Fully. But see what the inflation numbers are saying. While the federal government overnight has at 2 a.m. this morning, they were still in negotiations with labor. They're still going to continue by 7 p.m. tonight. Right. Can you help us? Make sense of all of that. Uh, thank you very much. I guess the first thing to look at is uh, the origins of the increase in minimum wage. So we had 18,000 naira as the minimum wage historically. Um, a lot of state governments were struggling to pay 15. Then suddenly there was a need to renegotiate and a compromise position of 30,000 was agreed. I believe that for political reasons, 30,000 was agreed, it became an act of parliament. And this happened before the general elections. Shortly after the election, suddenly the same government that agreed to a 30,000 naira minimum wage is calling for a review, ostensibly because the revenues to pay this new minimum wage does not exist. There is nothing that has changed fundamentally in the last six months. We knew six months ago that we were going to struggle to pay 30000 So the critical question is, why did we promise Nigerians a 30000 naira minimum wage when the capacity to make that payment is suspect at best? Very pertinent question mm. uh, waiting to be answered. But we mm. do know the rising inflation erodes mm. consumer um, purchasing power. Uh, at a time like this that we're talking about implementation, full implementation, because they, they do say they've uh, started implementing levels one to six. Mm -hmm. Whilst we are waiting for the negotiation outcome for this full implementation, what sort of implications or impacts are we likely to see? Well, inflation clearly will trend upwards. So we've started to see the signs. And a few things are driving the increase in inflation. The government woke up a recently to shut our land borders ostensibly to drive uh, the production, local production of some critical food items and to prevent continuous import of food, right? But there are other drivers of, econ of uh, inflation that are waiting in the wings. So minimum wage is just one of them, right? The increase in electricity tariffs, which will take effect in January of next year, is also there. Then the, uh, what you call this thing, the foil subsidy conversation is still there. We're talking 1.2 trillion naira that we do not have goes towards subsidizing petrol prices. Those are the drivers of inflation. And as inflation continues to increase, the Nigerian people become poorer because the naira in their pocket cannot buy as much as it bought previously. So these are the issues. So what is important today is what kind of policies uh, is government putting in place to address these headwinds that are looming? 
Okay. Speaking about mm. policies, mm -hmm. we're looking at the, the, the recent closure of the, of the border to mm. reduce, like you said, mm. smuggling of certain food items. But mm. we're seeing in the past three months that the, the food index has gone up, mm. the highest that we've seen. Talking about policies, don't you think that, or in your opinion, what do you think about this certain policy? You know, the federal government has said that we are actually reaping rewards by mm. closing the border, but then the Nigerian people are the ones suffering the negative uh, prices. What do you think about this policy? Um, whilst I understand in theory government's motivation to drive local production of food, because Nigeria has fertile land, right? Most of our geographical space is made up of arable land. So in theory, there should be no reason why we'll be importing food as aggressively as we're doing. But the reality is this, for agriculture and indeed any other sector of the economy to thrive, there has to be a framework, right? There has to be a support system. So the infrastructure is lacking. The farmers are unskilled. The mechanization that we require is also lacking. We still have farmers who are only planting in one season of the year, the wet season. Then in the entire white, uh, dry season, nothing is happening because we do not have storage infrastructure. We do not have processing infrastructure. The average farmer cannot access finance. They cannot access high quality seedlings. So there are a lot of issues that the agricultural sector is facing. So for government, in, a, in my view, rash move, shut the land borders, believing that somehow that will automatically increase local production of food. Yes, in the short term, right, you can see that indeed uh, local producers, the rice millers, for example, they have demands that they cannot meet. So even using that rice as the example, we have a shortfall of about 2 million metric tons uh, production uh, consumption gap now. If government says imported rice can no longer come in and the local producers cannot meet that gap, what happens is that rice prices continue to go up. And that's what we're seeing. 69% now. Absolutely. 69 and those are the already. things driving inflation. And you will see a further increase as we move towards the end of the year, the festive season. So Nigerians that should typically look for a few bright spots by the end of the year are now going to be faced with increasingly high food prices. I want to talk about subsidies. Mm. I mean, a couple of years back, President Goodluck Jonathan said, this is the elephant in the room, this is mm. the monster. We we'll take it off. Yeah. Guess what happened? Guess what Nigerians did? Guess what organized labor did? Mm. We shut this country down for the first four days in January. Yes. That was the Happy New Year present. Mm -hmm. We said, mm -hmm. we must keep subsidy. Mm. When are we going to have that conversation about subsidy? Because Nigerians have seen that 1.2 trillion we can account for going down the drain every time in the name of subsidy. When is the difficult time to have that conversation? Uh, the time is now, Rufai. Um, I think it was the NNPC or one governmental agency that came out recently and said in the last 10 or so years, we've expended in excess of 10 trillion naira. Uh, subsidizing petroleum products. Petro, that's that's petro. the same as this yeah. year's budget. Absolutely. Absolutely. On just subsidy. Mm, yes. And we have critical sectors like education and healthcare that are grossly underfunded. We need three trillion naira to fix our infrastructure. The budget for roads is 169 billion. Where do you want to start from? But going back to your subsidy question, Rufai, it is all about the trust deficit. You ask Nigerians to sacrifice. You ask Nigerians to tighten their belts. But they look at our public officials and they see no signs of sacrificing. On the contrary, they continue to live large. They continue to use taxpayers' monies to fund ostentatious lifestyles. So that is the problem. Because any which way you look at it, there is an adverse effect to increasing the price of petrol. Everybody knows that. But the Nigerian will be more willing to make that sacrifice if they see that the, uh, their political leaders are leading by example. It really does not make sense. In the 2020 budget proposal, government is planning to spend almost 5 trillion naira 
to pay salaries and overheads for how many Nigerians? We have a population of 200 million. I dare say the entire public service infrastructure across federal, state, and local government, I doubt that there are more than 5 million people. So how can you spend 5 trillion naira to look after the interest of 5 million people? And I am being overly generous with those numbers. So that is the trust deficit we're talking about. Let government significantly bring down the cost of governance. Let the Ronsai report of three, four, five years ago, let it be implemented. Let us merge ministries, departments, well, I'll, and agencies. I'll, I'll come back. We'll have mm. this quick break. We'll mm. talk about... There's still time. Okay, um, there's still time. We'll, you, we'll you, like to talk about the Ronsai report, mm. you know? Yes, we'll talk about revenue mm. generation and what you think for the, the projection for the mm. government. But let me take you back to what you said earlier about policies and tackling inflation. Right. What sort of monetary policies should we be seeing at this time? Should we be deploying? Uh, should we tighten up? Well, um, we are between a rock and a very hard place. Uh, the monetary policy authorities can only do so much. The major drivers of any economy are the combination of monetary and fiscal policy. So as much as the monetary authorities can respond to inflation by tightening rates, right, as long as the fiscal managers are irresponsible in the way right, funds are pushed out or certain critical policies are made, then there is really nothing that the monetary authorities can do. So my sense is you will see the CBN react by maybe tightening rates a bit more, so the NPR may increase. Unfortunately, what that does is the cost of borrowing money within the Nigerian economy goes up. Mm. The average entrepreneur will struggle. He's already or she, are, they're already facing enough challenges with uh, the cost of funds at the moment. This scenario will push cost of funds even higher. And that means that they will need to transfer those costs to their customers. But their customers don't have the money to buy. So inventory will build up, warehouses will be full. It's a vicious cycle. Okay, we'll come back to talk some more about the Niger economy and the impact of inflation so far. I will be right back after this break. Join us again. Right, still the morning show here on Arise News. And we're talking about Nigerian economy, inflation, and growth potentials and the likes uh, with Bayer an investment banker and the chief executive of Self Quest Advisory Services. I mean, I just, I mean, I, I wanted to ask a question about the Arosa report. And this was said, you know, there are too much reports. So, <laughs> so there are reports for this. There's a report for any, everything. Because when we keep talking about things like we talk about the election, we talk about the likes of uh, waste reports and like, I mean, let's not talk reports now. But I don't understand something. And this one, I think that's a very good question about. You know, the approach you take. We all see that the CBN is tightening, one way or the other. NPR, you know, pretty much remains the same. But when you look at it, you're tightening. You're not incentivizing borrowing. But you're telling banks that there's an increase in L there should be an, in there's an increase in LDR from 60 to 65%. That their loan deposit rate should go about 65%. But the lending economy is not favorable. I mean, you can't compare this to the EU when you have close to like 95% LDR rates. Right. right. So, is it that there's a policy fight or policy gymnastics going on in the CBN? What is happening? Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, the CBN is protected by law. The office of the governor of the central bank is meant to be independent of the executive arm of government. But unfortunately, that independence is only on paper. You have a central bank in Nigeria that is constantly looking at the executive, looking at the executive's body language, taking instructions and directives from the, from, from the executive. But Mr. Mephila said that's not true recently. He said it out there openly, that that's well, not true. The, 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 fact that, the fact that he mouths that, the fact that the statutes confer independence on that office does not mean that that is what happens in reality. Right? You cannot have a situation where the president makes declarations and pronouncements today and tomorrow morning the CBN comes up with policies that echo and seek to further that instruction. So the issue of independence is, is one that is up for debate. But my personal opinion is that office is not as independent as we would like it to be, number one. Secondly, you talked about the CBN's increase in the loan-to-deposit ratio. 
Again, theoretically, we know why the CBN is doing this. CBN wants a situation where banks, as critical players in any economy, rather than sit on their deposits or pack all of those deposits into uh, government treasury bills and all, the CBN is saying, let me stimulate economic activity. Let me force the banks to give out more loans. Yeah? So initially, it was 60%. Uh, there was a deadline. A lot of banks did not meet the deadline. The CBN seized and sterilized about half a trillion naira at 0% interest rates. Simultaneously, they increased the benchmark to 65 Right? What is going to happen is this. The banks cannot manufacture credible customers. If the economic environment, if the ease of doing business, if the infrastructure deficit and the various policy somersaults remain, then the average business becomes a risky entity to lend to. So you cannot legislate the creation of loans. These banks are private businesses. They are profit-oriented businesses. So they will only lend to those who they consider to be credible counterparties. So what I will think the government should do, which is why I said we are trying to use monetary policy to fix some fiscal policy deficits. Let us deal with the fiscal policy. Let us ensure that our revenue base is increased. Let us ensure that government has policies that it is willing to implement. You know, earlier on you alluded to uh, this who are talking about uh, the Oronsai report and all. Rufai, for 60 odd years in Nigeria, we have been coming up with one policy initiative after the other. There is no mystery about what is required to turn our economy or indeed our nation around. What has consistently been missing for 59 years is the political will to do those things. So we know what to do. And it's time we start doing but that. But recently the federal government set up, you know, uh, a committee of eggheads that could turn the economy around, you know, uh, advisory council. Uh, your colleague at, uh, at the LBS was on the uh, council, Professor Doing Salami, and the likes of former. He, had, he heads the council, in fact. Uh, the likes of Bismarck uh, Rewane, the likes Charles of uh, Charles Soludo. I mean, is it the advice they are giving the president that is leading to what some people are calling this knee jerk reaction of cutting travel costs? Is that part of the advice? Or they should give the big one, cutting subsidies. Because when we cut subsidies, we bring down the recurrence. Absolutely. Um, I, like, you, like you said, I know and uh, respect uh, a, a number of the uh, members of the Economic Advisory Council. Um, my view is, yes, they will tell us what we already know. They are going to tell the president, take away subsidies. They are going to tell the president, privatize the more than 600 government-owned enterprises that the DG of BP says cost us $3 billion to run every year. Rather than adding value to the Nigerian economy, they have become a drain pipe. Why are we still keeping them? In the last five years, in the last 10 years, how many moribund state-owned enterprises have been privatized. So we continue to use revenues we do not have to keep afloat government entities that are not adding any value to the economy. So they will tell the president privatize. They will tell the president uh, take away subsidies. They will tell the president rationalize ministries, departments, and agencies. We all know this. We've known this for 60-odd years. Hmm. Been talking about revenue, because you mentioned revenue, um, IMF's latest recommendation to the federal government is tax hike. Now, this has received quite the knocks from a number of analysts mm. who say Nigeria is overtaxed already. Uh, but IMF is saying that the only way to meet your debt service burden and infrastructural gap is to increase taxation. Mm. Um, how do we go about this? Okay. Um, I know where the IMF is coming from. Um, the IMS, IMF is looking for Nigeria to increase its revenue base. Our Minister of Finance has said, we don't have a debt problem, we have a revenue problem. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I dare to disagree with both the minister and the IMF. The problem we have is an expenditure problem. Bring down that expenditure and start to see whether revenues will not ramp up. We spoke about the trust deficit earlier. In Lagos State, for example, the governor of Lagos State says four and a half million adults are taxable within Lagos State, but only 700,000 of them actually pay taxes. So the governor is saying it's not about increasing the tax rate for the 700 that are already within the net, it's to broaden the net and encourage more people to come in. It is the same thing at the federal level. So government, rather than increase taxes, so this is where I disagree with the IMF, mm -hmm. don't increase taxes for the 10, 15 million Nigerians that are in the net. Bring the extra 40, 45 million that are not in the tax net, bring them in. How do you bring them in? It's by incentivizing them, right? The average Nigerian does not believe that they have a government. They are governments unto themselves. Yeah. They provide their own security, their own electricity, and so on and so forth. Yeah? So for you to convince that person to willingly come into the tax net, there has to be an incentive. So you have to say, you know what? Come and register. And maybe for the first 12, 24, 36 months, you will pay 0% tax. We just want to know who you are, what you do, where you are. Then from year two or year three, you tax them. Rather than 30% corporate uh, tax rate, okay, start with 10% increase to 15 and 20. Within five years, you would have hit 30, 40 million people within the tax net. That's where your revenues come from, because that is sustainable. Mm. That is how government can now have the basis to plan, right? And then truly diversify this economy away from crude oil and all of that and all of that. So we know what to do. Okay, so bringing it back to the Economic mm. Advisory Council, mm. um, Mr. Femi Adishino uh, said, has said that the, they were charged with actually the first, the most important task was for them to, to focus on data collection because mm. the president believes that the, uh, the data that we're getting from the IMF is not 100% accurate, that we should be the ones putting together our data. Now, do you think that this is, in, this, this is an important move? Because that's what he's charged them uh, to do I first. mean, I, I just laugh, but what does the MBS do? Uh, thank you. You know, you, you, you took the words out of my mouth. Uh, with maximum respect uh, to the office of the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, uh, that was an ill-advised statement. Um, we do not lack data. Uh, we have the uh, National Bureau of Statistics uh, that is run by a, an extremely competent leadership. Yeah? The quality of the data that comes out of that institution is relied upon by even these global institutions we're talking about. So we do not have a data problem. We have an implementation problem because the EAC is advisory. It reports or it will report to the president once a month. But you have uh, an economic management team, which is really the implementing organ because it has the heads of critical government agencies as part of its membership. You scrap that and replace it with an advisory body by all means, establish the advisory body, but keep the EMT. So they come up with a broad picture, and the EMT is tasked with the responsibility of implementation. So they will have complemented each other. So now you have gone for an advisory body, and you've essentially taken out a standing committee. But isn't that duplicity of function when you have the National Economic Council headed by the vice president and has the ministers and the heads of these agencies you talk about? I agree. But, you know, the, that's why I use the word standing committee, mm. because the EMT is supposed to be a smaller group. The NEC is 36 governors plus maybe the membership is 50 or 60. Mm -hmm. The EMT is a smaller group of eggheads, of leadership of critical government Very agencies. Nimble. Very nimble. And that's what we need at this time. So by all means, bring private sector practitioners such as the EAC people and let them work in consultation or in collaboration with the EMT. Let's talk about debt. I mean, yeah. debt is very poignant. I think it's in Times Square in New York that you'll see a big barn of America's debt and your family's share. <laughs> and it's always out there staring at you in the face. Yes. Uh, I'll just pause this. We'll, we'll go to a break. I will come back. Um, and uh, debt... I mean, there's a big conversation on debt. During about the just time, they say we're the only country that paid a debt, still owe $36 billion. After paying the debt, I will pay $30 billion for the debt. 
now it has increased 700 borrowed, over 700, I mean, 700 billion borrowed in the last couple of months, and now it's 25.4 trillion naira. We'll be right back to talk about debt and more after this quick commercial break. Thank you very much uh, for still joining us. So we're still talking to Bayer Rutimi, investment banker, chief executive officer of Quest Advisory, talking about the economy and sundry issues. Uh, like I was saying, debt, a big one, 25.4 trillion, that's two times of our national budget. And the, the caveat is not even the debt itself, but the debt service. We're spending close to 70% of our budget I mean, to service the debt. Um, it's, it's crazy, isn't thank, it? Thank you very much. I, I think we are, we are sitting on a keg of gunpowder um, because I understand debt. You know, in finance theory, debt is an efficient way or it's supposed to be an efficient way to fund your operations. But when it goes beyond a particular level, then the risk of collapse, the risk of bankruptcy becomes very, very high. Now, is the debt, is Nigeria's debt profile today sustainable? The answer is no. Because if a significant, if the majority of your revenues are going towards debt service, then where do you have the revenues to fund social infrastructure? Because I think that's where the bulk of our revenue should go, healthcare and education. The physical infrastructure, all government needs to do, privatize the uh, government entities, encourage foreign and local direct investments, and private sector capital to go into those areas of the provision of hard infrastructure. Lagos Ibadan Expressway, we have no business spending 100, 150 billion trying to fix that road. Bring private sector, concession it, let them fund it. But what happened to buy Courtney? Uh, <laughs> now, because uh, sometimes you get it wrong, it doesn't mean that uh, concessions and privatizations, that in, in, implicitly there is a problem with those things. No, it is down to the same uh, implementation problem that we have. Did you ensure that the most qualified counterparty was the one to whom those well, roads were concessioned? Well, they did the MMA uh, too very well. I, well, the jury, the jury, the jury is out on that. <laughs> the jury is out on that. We know that clearly MMA two is an improvement over what we had before. Mm -hmm. But is that the best we could have gotten? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, talking about mm -hmm. debt, uh, you have said before, mm -hmm. and we all know the minister has said. You know, there's nothing wrong with debt when it's safe zone. Mm. But recently, uh, she has also said, you know, our debt is local. What do you make of that? It's not uh, our majority mm. of our debt is local. Yeah. Is that still safe? Well, is it a more expensive? It is more expensive. So, yes, we have easily 65 to 70 percent of our debt being local debt. But what does such a significant amount of local debt do? Mm -hmm. It starves the private sector of capital that should have come to them. We were talking about the likelihood of further tightening by CBN. Once that further tightening happens, you will find out that even these banks, they would rather risk the penalty from CBN, right, than to lend into risky ventures. So you will still find a lot of their capital will go into risk-free government securities, which ultimately increases local debt more expensive, as you said, which pushes up our debt service ratio or the proportion of our revenues that go to debt service. So it is a vicious cycle, right? In the 2020, 2019 budget, there was at least two and a half trillion naira of deficit. In the proposed 2020 budget, there is still another 2.1, 2.2 trillion worth of deficit. So government has uh, come to the realization that there is no way to fund our budget if we don't have significant debt. But the question is this. To what extent have we ensured that every naira we borrow is judiciously utilized? That's a big conversation. Because if you use debt to fund recurrent expenditure, then you are digging yourself into a deeper hole. If it is largely for critical infrastructure, then at least we know where the money is going mm -hmm. and we see the multiplier effect and the benefit to the economy. A lot of people are talking about the silver bullet for all of this being QE that it's time for the CBN to, to take that plunge head on, quantitative easing, buy out all those treasury, uh, government treasury bills, buy out all those bonds. 
knock down interest rates, revitalize the economy, and it will bounce up like a, a bouncing baby, like they say in Nigerian <laughs> parlance. <laughs> uh, Rufai, we have a debt crisis. The Central Bank of Nigeria has funded the federal government to the tune of 4.4 trillion naira, right? So we have 5 trillion naira, or give or take 5.5 trillion, in Amcon bonds that will soon crystallize. Amcon was set up for, a 10, year, for 10 years. Amcon started their job in 2010. So in theory, if there is no extension, next year, those bonds need to be repaid. Where will the funding come from? So quantitative easing you've spoken about, it's just a big man's language for printing money. Yeah, and we've been printing money for a long time. Central banks all over the world have, at some point in time, no choice but to resort to printing money. The United States, the, the Federal Reserve in America has done that. The Bank of England has done that. We understand all of that. The challenge has always been, for every one naira of debt, can you show me what that debt was utilized for and how much economic benefit Nigeria and Nigerians got from that? That has always been the problem. If you are borrowing to pay salaries, then you are not helping the national economy. So my view is there is no silver bullet. The, well, the closest to a silver bullet has to be maybe a restructuring of the polity, yeah? Maybe a de-emphasizing of the federal government as the biggest player in the economy. So it goes back to a constitutional review. There are too many things in the exclusive preserve of the federal government, yeah? The office of the president in Nigeria is too powerful. So that gentleman is almost unaccountable to anybody. So there is a need for a fundamental restructuring. It doesn't also mean that the people at the states and local government level are saints. Mm. You know, we have a lot of brigandage in those places also. You know, so unfortunately for us, we are at this sorry pass. And my own view is unless and until we start to reorder our priorities. By all means, we need physical infrastructure. But like Bill Gates said, invest in the people. Another, that is the greatest. Another silver bullet. <laughs> could, it, could it just mm. be the pension fund? Well, the pension fund, all the latest number now, I think it's like over... Over, over six, seven trillion. Over six, almost six and a half trillion. So that's a lot of money. But if I go and look at how those monies have been invested, easily 70 to 80% of them have been in government debt. Mm. So for all intents and, or to all intents and purposes, right, the government has borrowed the majority of those pension assets. Already? Oh, yeah, because it is in government bonds. It is in treasury bills. So the PFAs are not investing in the equities market because consistently the market has been declining. Year to date this year, 14%. So nobody, no pension fund administrator will take the bulk of the assets and put in there. But can we create infrastructure bonds? And can some of this money go in there? It has started, but a lot more needs to be done. You have spoken about the physical in uh, infrastructure, and it takes me back to mm. the, the, the statement that the president gave when he came into, into power this year, mm. where he said he was going to lift 100 million people out of poverty in mm. 10 years. Now, there's a school of thought that says that the government should concentrate on providing the social in uh, infrastructure that would also encourage the social uh, sector to right. expand outputs. Do you agree with this school of thought? Do you think it's something that the government should focus on? I, I agree. I agree. I believe that one of the greatest challenges we face as a nation is uh, lack of capacity. Our human capital are undereducated or uneducated, unskilled. So for you to really transform an economy, you must invest in the people. UNESCO says 20% of countries' budgets should be devoted to education. I dare say I cannot remember the last time in the last 20, 30, 40 years that we have achieved 5% of budget going to education. A significant proportion of budget should also go into health care. 
You know, that is the fundamental basis. That's the foundation upon which a nation is built. But when you have an army of uneducated people, then you will definitely have an army of unemployed people. Then your security situation will worsen. And these are all the things we are facing today. So I like a scenario, I would like a scenario where the bulk of our budgets go towards social investments. It's a vicious circle. Thank you so much, Faya Rotimi, for coming on the show this Thank morning. It's been a fantastic 45 minutes. We do appreciate that. But that brings us to the end of the morning show today. I am Ade Soa Omoruan. I'm Rafael saying it's been a day of plenty of silver bullets. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Shaito Atigari. Thank you for watching from our entire team here in Lagos. Enjoy the rest of your morning and, of course, the rest of your day. Goodbye.